Good evening. I'm Dina Mansour, Executive Director of the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Center. Welcome to our Fall 2020 Mansfield Dialogue Series. This event is live on Zoom and Facebook through both the Mansfield Center as well as Missoula Community Access Television. This event will be recorded by Missoula Community Access Television as part of its Media Assistance Grants Program to nonprofit organizations and will be available for future viewing. I ask that you please keep your mic muted, your video off, and ensure that your screen is on speaker view rather than gallery view. We hope that tonight truly meets the definition of dialogue and that you will um, engage in that civil dialogue by including your questions and your comments in the chat box uh, throughout tonight's discussion. Tonight has special meaning for me as I have long admired the work of one of our distinguished speakers, Andreas Harsono. When I served as a diplomat at the US Embassy in Jakarta in the mid 1990s, my portfolio included visiting imprisoned journalists and monitoring trials on press freedom. Andreas was one of the leaders in advocating for an independent media and taught me and so many others the importance of the freedoms and rights of one of our most critical institutions. So I'll start by introducing our moderator tonight, the perfect interlocutor for this conversation. Dr. Jody Pavlak is Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of History here at the University of Montana. She teaches courses in colonial and modern Latin American history, addressing such topics as US Latin America relations, labor and working class history, and human rights and the politics of memory in Latin America. Her research focuses on the 20th century social and political history of Latin America with particular expertise in Chilean history. Her book, Mining for the Nation, the politics of Chile's coal communities from the popular front to the Cold War has won two major awards. She's now conducting research on a new book project currently titled Globalizing the New Deal, Transnational Links Among US and Latin American Progressives from 1932 to 1954. So Jody, thank you so much for joining us tonight and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, well, thank you, Dina. I, I really want to thank you and the Mansfield Center for inviting me to participate in this event in the midst of many kind of depressing things going on around me. I cannot tell you how intellectually and politically stimulated, excited I have been. I mean, I can't say I've actually enjoyed the past few weeks of immersing myself in Vincent and Andreas's work because of the intense uh, and, and in many times painful nature of it. Um, I valued it intellectually and politically um, very much. It, in that vein, I would just like to tell all of the people who've joined us today um, that what we're gonna be able to do here in this hour is barely gonna scratch the surface of the you know really significant work that Mr. Bevins and Mr. Harsono are doing. And I, I would encourage you to take this as kind of an enticing movie trailer um, and to follow up by going out and reading their books and articles and uh, following their blog writings and their, uh, their Twitter feeds and the many interviews that they've done on podcasts and um, YouTube and whatnot. There's just a rich, rich, rich body of work and uh, we're just barely gonna touch it. Um, so beginning, I just uh, will introduce each of our scholars and then maybe say just kind of few remarks from my perspective as a Latin American historian, uh, beginning with Mr. Uh, Bevins, Vincent Bevins is a US journalist who also holds a master's degree in international political economy from the London School of Economics. From 2011 to 2016, he was in Brazil as a foreign correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. And there he began to uncover the deep history and ongoing trauma of the state of, of, uh, of the state violence, the episode of state violence unleashed against the mobilized left and popular sectors, beginning with the military coup in 1964, and especially after 1968 with the rise of more hardline generals who took explicitly adopted um, a campaign known as Operação Jakarta, or the Jakarta Operation, 
of deliberately killing off large segments of the national citizenry who were pursuing progressive, anti-colonial, social democratic, centrist, center left, or even revolutionary routes to true national sovereignty and greater socioeconomic, political, cultural justice and greater equality. In 2017, Mr. Bevins then moved to Jakarta, Indonesia and to uh, begin covering Southeast Asia for the Washington Post. Um, and there he again encountered ongoing trauma and what I gather to be more um, muted or contorted, uh, fragmented uh, memory and discourse um, around the largest anti-communist mass killing in the third world, which took place under dictator Suharto uh, from 1965 uh, into 1966, over six months of mass killings and then continuing on um, in a lesser degree um, until his resignation in 1998, which uh, incidentally was the same year that Chilean dictator Augusto uh, Pinochet Ugarte was arrested in London. Um, though millions of people across the 15,000 or so islands that make up Indonesia were arrested, tortured, murdered, and disappeared by their own national security forces, and though the country did transition back to a form of civilian liberal democracy after 1998, uh, this episode of intentional mass murder has been largely forgotten, left out of the writing of 20th century history um, in much the same vein, I think, as uh, Haitian scholar Michelle Rolf Trouillot writes about the Haitian Revolution as unthinkable history, as a series of incidents that occurred that were so far outside of, uh, of the parameters of the very language that we use to describe ourselves and our history and our role in the world, that this incident was simply omitted, forgotten, repressed, left out of the history. So this, um, as I understand it, uh, prompted Mr. Bevins to spend two years pulling together his uh, pr pretty vast knowledge and contacts um, Am I unmuted? Now you're unmuted. Sorry, yeah. I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, so this prompted Mr. Bevins to spend two years pulling together his knowledge and contacts, conducting many incredibly rich interviews, delving into archives, and uh, talking to historians. Um, and you know, reading through his acknowledgments, and at least from what I know in Latin America, talking to you know premier absolute perfect historians for what he wanted to find out um, and digesting a really impressive array of bodies of secondary scholarship to produce a stunning, uh, stunningly written, powerful book called The Jakarta Method, Washington's Anti-Communist Crusade and the Mass Murder Program that Shaped Our World, which just came out this year um, with Public Affairs Press of New York. As a historian of the country neighboring Brazil, Chile, um, where I lived between 1996 to 2001, I think I have seen and heard the word Jakarta, Operation Jakarta, Plan Jakarta, Method Jakarta, many times in many primary sources and some secondary sources. But to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, it, it's like driving down a road that you've driven down every day for years and never seen a groundhog because it wasn't in your consciousness to see a groundhog. And then someone tells you that there are groundhogs all over the place and all you can see are groundhogs. Uh, this is what Bevins uncovered and, and, power, and brings powerfully into our vision in the Jakarta method. These, this previously first, this previously unseen tunnel uh, riddled with CIA telegrams and US State Department letters uh, between the mass killing of leftist Indonesians in 1965, 66 and the terror unleashed 
against leftist Brazilians after 1968. But Bevan's intricately crafted narrative goes further to situate both of these significant and intricately intertwined national events in the broader context of the global Cold War, weaving in the stories of Vietnam, the Philippines, Cuba, Guatemala, and of course, China and the Soviet Union. Um, but to me, equally impressive as the chronological and geographical sweep of this really, I, I don't mean to sound so sycophantic, but very masterful book, um, is, is his continual smooth back and forth from global economic conditions and political institutions to personal life narratives that Mr. Bevins brings to us after years of forming relationships of trust and conducting deep moving oral interviews. These are, you know, to use a phrase that I have a lot of problems with, I mean, he brings into the historical record the voice of the voiceless. Um, the book somehow also manages to include really fascinating discussions of how to make historical sense of the process of forgetting and remembering and the power of myths, legends, exaggerations, and outright lies as forces of history. Mr. Bevan's book brings to the general reading public a comprehensive look at the entire 20th century across the globe and how the US waged war throughout the third world against nationalist, social democratic, left-leaning and leftist forces that potentially might have blocked or impeded the US path to global hegemony in what Henry Luce famously described as the American century. Um, and I, uh, I, you probably can't see here, but I have worn for my occasion, for this occasion, some of my finest gold jewelry um, uh, in remembrance of the large gold mine uh, that Mr. Bevins mentions as uh, being discovered or taken over uh, by foreign capital um, shortly after Suharto took over power. Um, and just kind of to throw out that I think what really is at play in this book and, you know, it, it, in the work of both Mr. Bevins and Mr. Hosarno is, you know, wh what was at stake in U.S repression of nationalist, progressive, leftist, communist, social democratic forces in the 20th century, you know, was, was fundamentally the lifestyle that we live in the United States. The ability for, you know, a middle-class professor to afford gold jewelry, and I could pan over here to my stack of Amazon boxes to put plastic toys under the trees of my children. Um, you know, I think this is, uh, you know, really what they're dealing with was what was really at stake uh, in the uh, wars that the United States sponsored against masses of people who I think Mr. Bevins um, explains powerfully as innocent, as innocent regardless of whether or not they belong to such and such political party or held such and such ideological views, but innocent of crimes. These were not violent movements. These were people who were fighting for a better lives for themselves and their children. So while Mr. Bevan's book branches out globally and gives us this big picture, Mr. Andreas Hosarno's work is deeply embedded in Indonesian history and society. For decades, he has been reporting, writing, and standing up for free press rights and human rights more broadly across Indonesia and Southeast Asia. In 1994, he helped establish Jakarta's Alliance of Independent Journalists. And in later years, he participated in founding Bangkok's Southeast Asia Press Alliance, the Jakarta-based Institute for uh, st the Studies on the Free Flow of Information, and the Pentau Foundation. He has worked as a reporter, writer, and editor for many significant newspapers and journals throughout the region. Since 2008, Mr. Hosarno 
has covered Indonesia for Human Rights Watch, providing informed, powerfully written article after article. Most recently, in 2019, Mr. Harsarno offered the English reading world a significant book entitled Race, Islam and Power, Ethnic and Religious Violence in Post-Suharto Indonesia. As one reviewer of the book remarked, it comes to us from one of the, quote, most knowledgeable, experienced, high profile, and courageous of reporters and commentators on contemporary Indonesian society. So again, uh, we are, I am very honored to have both Mr. Vincent Bevins and Mr. Andreas Hosarno here with us this evening. And I will now turn the floor over to them to talk about any aspect of their rich work they want to. Um, again, please type any questions for them into the chat. And when they're done speaking, we'll try to get to um, as many questions and comments as possible. Um, and I will now um, turn the floor over to Mr. Bevins. Thank you. Um, wow, so hello and um, thank you so much for that, uh, that, for that introduction. I mean, it was really <laughs> incredible in, in addition to being very kind, of course, it gave me a lot to think about. I think the quote about um, events that are so outside, so far outside the parameters which we can understand that they get sort of pushed outside um, the historical narrative is really apt and I'm gonna try to look that quote up uh, later, but um, Thank you also to, to, for the invitation and to everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here, but it's really an honor to be here, um, especially doing an event with Andreas Harsono, who is a true expert on Indonesia, unlike me, who's just a, I'm just a journalist who spent a few years there. Um, and I owe him a huge debt of gratitude for the work that I did as a journalist and on this book. And I think almost every reporter that's been through Jakarta has owes him a lot to it. So it's, I feel really humble to be, to be alongside him. Um, so then, since this is a university talk, and since Andreas is here, maybe I'll start with what I did not do in order to write um, this book that came out this year, The Jakarta Method. Um, I did not establish full expertise on what happened um, in the massacre in Indonesia in the 1960s. Um, that would have taken a lifetime, and, and many people have dedicated their lives to that. I wouldn't be so arrogant to try to rewrite that history. Um, and that's not what I did. Um, to tell the story of that event, um, I relied on the consensus already established by historians like Brad Simpson, Bhaskara Wardaya, Jess Melvin, John Rusa, people like Andreas Harsono, uh, who helped me quite a bit at the beginning, as well as declassified documents. Um, and just to be clear about what did happen in 1965 and 1966 in Indonesia, the US backed military intentionally killed approximately 1 million innocent civilians, maybe less, maybe more, we don't know, as part of the construction of the Suharto dictatorship, which became one of the most important allies of the United States and the West in the Cold War. Um, this was one of the most important turning points of the 20th century. And it was seen by such a victory um, by other, uh, it's seen as such a victory by other uh, right wing US allied um, movements in the Cold War that they took inspiration from it and put in place their own versions of anti-communist terror based on what they had heard about in Indonesia. So what did I do if I didn't become an expert on 1965 or try to rewrite that story? Um, two things, basically. First, I did a lot of interviews with victims of US-backed anti-communist violence. Survivors, of course, those who, who made it, those are, who are still around and did not actually have their lives taken away by this horrible process. Um, and I did this to try to create a human story that might connect with regular people to show what was really involved, who was really active in the 20th century, who really suffered, and to show, um, to make it a real story because it was a very real thing. Um, because often when regular people in the English speaking world hear about communists, uh, they assume we're talking about some shadowy armed malevolent insurrectionary group. This was absolutely not the case with the Indonesian Communist Party. It was the largest unarmed socialist organization in the world, uh, perhaps in history. Uh, and it operated very openly, um, perhaps 20, 25% of the country was associated with the party in one way or another, either as um, full members or in one of the many associated uh, organizations, whether a cultural organization or educational organization or farmers organizations. This was 
a organization this is, that operated very, very publicly and very proudly um, in Indonesian society. These were not cartoon villains. These were not villains at all. These were regular people killed only for their political beliefs or being associated with the wrong political beliefs. Uh, and this was not in, only in Indonesia, but all over the world. Um, the second thing that I did is I took this story and I put it in the widest context possible, like a, a ridiculously, stupidly, almost intentionally, absurdly wide context. I mean, I start the book by explaining what the United States is, for example. And I think by, by employing this, um, this um, uh, exaggerated wide lens, um, we can learn a lot about the world and we can, and, and a lot of uh, connections uh, 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 appear um, as a result of doing so. And as that really gracious introduction uh, indicated, you start to, you start to see things when you, when you put all, all a certain, these events next to each other, when you really step back as far as possible and put this um, Indonesian massacre in context. Um, so what is that relevant context again? Um, being very simplistic, uh, at the end of World War II, the United States emerged as the most powerful country on earth, by far, militarily, politically, economically. Um, and the world, very uh, simplistically, again, was divided into three spheres, three worlds. Um, there was the first, second, and third world. Now, the first world was now led by the United States, but it consisted mostly of Western Europe, and the countries that had previously formally um, controlled most of the country through direct colonial power. Right? Um, so everyone in the first world was rich and a former imperial power. The United States and uh, US imperialism operated a little bit differently than uh, Western European imperialism. Uh, Japan's imperialism operated a little bit different. I, I include Japan in the first world. But all these rich first world countries had played some part in the subjugation of the mass vast majority of humanity over the, the previous centuries. Then there was the second world, which was the world led in Moscow. That was the Soviet Union and the parts of Central Europe liberated or taken over by the Red Army at the end of World War II. Then there was the third world, the vast majority of the humans on the planet. And the third world was not just a category imposed from outside. It was just not, it was not just a classification, it was an idea and a movement. Um, and this, this movement was a very forward looking, optimistic and idealistic project. It is nothing like the idea that comes to mind when we say third world now in the English language because the, the term third world has been degraded in the English language by the racists of the speakers of the English language over the last decades. But at the time to be a part of the third world movement was to mean that you believed that now that the formal colonization of the global south was over, it was now time for Indonesia and India and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa and Latin America to take their rightful place alongside the first and second world and do and be as important, if not more important, maybe do a better job than they ever had. It was natural um, to believe at the time, and I spoke to a lot of people that explained very emotionally to me that how, how deeply they believed this, that now that formal colonialism was over, it was the time for the world's black and brown and, and, and all associated non-Western European peoples to stand up and take their place on the global stage. And, and President Sukarno, the founding father of Indonesia, um, um, one of many uh, revolutionary figures, but he became the first president. And he was very much supplied the ideology for what became early Indonesian identity, was one of the leaders of the third world movement. Uh, um, along with Nehru in India, he was one of the loudest proponents of this vision of, 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 of the future. Um, and the first, second, and third worlds start to interact, of course, uh, in, in, in the beginning uh, of the post-war era. Now, the United States, now the most important country in history, um, does not have the kind of thing that Britain had over the hundreds of years that it had its empire, did not have a permanent spy organization that organized covert operations throughout the world. Um, so this young country very quickly awarded status of the most powerful country in history by, by its economic growth and the outcome of World, world, world Wars I and II creates the CIA soon after uh, the end of World War II. 
Now, the CIA tried to take on the Second World War, so to try to take on the Second World, I'm sorry, in the first years after World War II, but they largely failed. Um, when they tried to uh, crack the, uh, you know, to, to get behind the Iron Curtain and really mess up actual armed, prepared communist countries, they failed. They sent a lot of people to their deaths and they refocused to the third world. And so I think it's accurate to say, if we consider every human life on the planet to be equal, that the Cold War was really fought in the third world, not between the first and second world. So over the, the following years, um, the US foreign policy establishment did not only believe that communism was bad and the Soviet Union was a threat, they also believed, not cynically believed, the US corporations had a right to operate free, freely throughout the world and they, they should do so. Now, these two things combined very frequently as the US intervened over and over again in the third world. Now, it was done in a different way than the Europeans had interacted with the third world in, in, over the centuries of formal colonialism, but I would argue that the goals were largely the same. And President Sucardo loved to use the term neocolonialism to describe this. I don't think that term is wrong. I think you can use other terms, hegemony uh, 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 being the, the, probably the best one for this context, um, but I don't think that, that term is wrong. And so the United States intervened in the, in the third world um, through regime change, economic pressure, military invasion. But there was another tactic, which is the focus of my book. Um, another this a tactic that is, I think, not sufficiently understood, especially in the English speaking world, which was the mass murder of civilians that were seen as a threat to the right wing authoritarian capitalist regimes that were to a very large extent responsible for creating the free world, the, the, the universe of US allied countries in the third world. It was to take innocent civilians and round them up and kill them because it was seen that they were going to get in the way of constructing regimes that were two very important things here, poorest US capital and allied with the United States in the Cold War. Now, very quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll explain um, how we get to this um, tactic being employed in Indonesia, but, but, I'll, but I should say first that this was, Indonesia was not the first time this happened in, in the Cold War. The first was, I believe probably in Guatemala in 1954 when the US embassy after the successful US CIA backed uh, coup that overthrew Hoka uh, Buarbens directed the new military regime to kill leftists and gave them lists and, and told them to do it. Then there was the 1963 Ba'ath Party coup in Iraq involving a young officer uh, named Saddam Hussein who came over later to be part of the terror program in which the United States handed over list for for uh, the new Iraqi uh, regime, uh, short-lived regime as it happens um, to kill. So, but in Indonesia, again, now the fourth most populous country in the world, leader of the, the, the um, uh, third world movement, a very important country in the 50s and 60s. Uh, it was considered much more important than Vietnam by the US foreign policy establishment um, in the early 60s, for example. The US did not come immediately with this playbook of let's kill everybody, right? So from 1955 to 1965, the US foreign policy establishment tried a number of things to crush Sukarno's version of left friendly, left leaning anti-imperialist Indonesia and to crush the Indonesian Communist Party. Um, the first major one was in 1955, they started funding money to a right wing conservative uh, party, Masumi, that didn't work. The Indonesian Communist Party stopped, kept winning elections. In 1958, the CIA started bombing the country, um, essentially taking part in a civil war, which it, which it had promoted and, and created um, in the hopes of breaking Indonesia into pieces. And then finally, in 1964, you, uh, CIA and MI6 start uh, uh, covertly agitating to create a clash between the very well-armed Indonesian military and the unarmed Communist Party, hoping, knowing that if this were to happen, the the Indonesian military would have an opportunity to crush the left. And this is finally what happened with the disappearance of 500,000 to a million or more people and, and the imprisonment of another million people. So, as I said, this was a huge deal on both the left and the right at the time. Um, across the world on the left, socialist movements looked to Indonesia and said, 
oh, we can't be unarmed. We have to get radical. We have to go to the mountains. We have to reject the collaboration, reject collaboration with the national bourgeoisie, which was often the path um, um, given to them by Moscow. We need to get ready because the forces of reaction will come for us. And a lot of left-wing movements radicalized as a result in 1965. And then, as I said, right-wing groups looked and they saw something that was inspiring to them, something that they could do, not only do, and that would, it would not, they can not only do it, but it would also be effective and they could get away with it because the most powerful country in history would pat them on the back and say, good job, we're gonna help you get past this. Um, and, uh, the 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 path that I choose to trace from Indonesia to this to the um, continuation of this method in other countries um, starts in Chile in 1970 when Salvador Allende is elected president, um, believing that there is a socialist democratic path, uh, a democratic path to socialism. Now there had been many terror campaigns against Allende before and after um, his his election. Um, this involved paying off radio stations, putting flyers all over the, 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 the streets of, of Santiago and other cities, um, um, paying graffiti artists to, to point, to, to, to write all kinds of things on the walls. But the thing that I focus on is that in 1972, um, in the same year that in Brazil, where there had been a US spectacle in 1964, um, that you hear about Jakarta behind the scenes the Brazilian military is talking about Operación Jakarta, as she, as she referred to behind the scenes. In Chile, we have a graffiti program on the streets of Santiago that says Jakarta is coming or simply Jakarta. And the message that was very clear to anybody uh, paying attention to the Cold War at the time was, we're going to do what they did in Indonesia to you. We're going to kill you just like Indonesia killed their leftists. And tragically, this is exactly what happened. Jakarta did come in 1973 when the CIA backed coup, uh, removed Allende and installed Pinochet. Um, and then it did not stop there. After 3000 approximately people killed in, in Chile, uh, Brazil gets together with Chile and, and other authoritarian capitalist regimes in South America and, and forms something called Operation Condor, which is an international mass murder network created to eliminate leftists across South America. Um, the US again, backed all these countries, likely supplied the sort of very basic internet infrastructure that allowed this mass murder to take place. And you had mass murder and tens of thousands of deaths across South America. This moves up to Central America in the eighties. Um, again, you have connections between South American Operation Condor countries and Central American um, US backed right wing regimes. And they talk about Jakarta, they talk about this, this method. Um, of disappearances and terror and say that it works. Um, and over the course of my research, I found that in at least 20 countries around the world, you, we saw in the 20th century, the intentional mass murder of leftists or people accused of being leftists. Um, and my final point here is that this was not only an unfathomable, un immeasurable human rights abuse, it also shaped the nature of many of the re regimes that it, that it created, right? A country, a, a, a government created by the Jakarta method or created by uh, um, mass anti-left terror was profoundly shaped by that, right? Um, not only because they were violent themselves, but because of the, of the corruption that was allowed, the way that all social movements were, were really removed from the public sphere. Um, and really in, dozens of countries, not just the ones uh, uh, that I listed in that list of 20, um, the method really shaped the societies that exist to this day in, 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 in these countries. And, and Andreas uh, Harsona was somebody that knows a lot about this. I remember we, we met for a coffee years ago and, and he told me, well, um, 1965 shaped almost everything that came afterward, after it. Um, and his excellent book is about the the, the, the the all the types of violence that have proliferated um, over the years and in, in, in the ways that um, they interact with so many different elements of, of Indonesia's um, very diverse society. But that is the ultimate point that I think I came to by putting these this human story in such a very wide context is that 
this method, this intentional murder of the opponents or the perceived opponents of US, growing US hegemony was such a fundamental part of the way that the Cold War was won that it shaped the world that the Cold War gave us. And that's the world that we're all sitting in right now. So I'm really looking in forward to, um, to hearing uh, from, from Andreas on this as well. Thank you. Thanks uh, for that fabulous um, introduction and transition, Vincent. Let's turn the floor over to Mr. Andreas Harsono of Human Rights Watch Indonesia. Uh, thank you so much. It is really an honor to be on the same panel with both of you. I learned about the phrase Jakarta Operation since I was a student in college in the 1980s. <clears throat> it is not a surprise, of course, to see how that method is being replicated in many parts of the world. My talk is not about 1965, not about the Jakarta method, but the aftermath, what happened in the decades after those brutal period. I will provide with many pictures so the audience could get a better sense where all of this violence happened. I hope it is working well. There you go. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, there you go. Uh, I write a book about the violence in post Suharto Indonesia. Suharto being the man who was in charge of Indonesia after the 1965 massacre. He fell down from power in 1998 during the Asian economic crisis. Uh, the Asian economic crisis is a, is a key argument. Why? Because massive violence in Indonesia only happened when there is a global crisis. 1998, Asian economic crisis, 65, the Cold War, 1945, 46, 47, the end of World War II. So if there is a global crisis, it will affect Indonesia. I travel into 90 locations, mass graves, tsunami ravaged areas, ethnic violence, sectarian wars, indigenous people resisting modern military and cemetery. My main argument in this book is that violence beats at violence, impunity beats at impunity. And that is what we are seeing repeatedly all over Indonesia. This is the map of Indonesia. If you are someone growing up in Indonesia, you are familiar with a song entitled from Sabang. Sabang is a small island here north of Sumatra to Merauke. Merauke is here. Sabang and Merauke is imagined as the nation of Indonesia. So the song is, if I may to sing that song, Dari Sabang sampai Merauke berjajar pulau-pulau from Sabang to Merauke, island after island. Sambung menyambung menjadi satu, itulah Indonesia, uh, connecting those islands into a single unit called Indonesia. So I basically try to use that song, that slogan, uh, to travel in this many part of Indonesia, geographically five time zone. And, and by the way, for Indonesian audience, that slogan was not created by an Indonesian. It was created by a Dutch a general who won the war in Aceh. Thus, we start with Aceh. This is Suharto, fell down from power, 98. Uh, this is Aceh. Uh, Sabang Island, where I started, where the song started, is here. In 1976, 
Aceh Nationalist declare independence, saying that Indonesian nation is the pseudonym of Java nation, that Java, the most important island in Indonesia, cannot survive without the other islands. And they managed to have a parallel government after the fall of Java. Military operation, many were killed, but the tsunami 2004 ended the war and made the uh, Helsinki Agreement Aceh become autonomous, but later implementing what they call to be Islamic Sharia. And today, Aceh is a new, in the news headline because of discriminating non-Muslim, non-Sunni minorities. Indonesia is a Sunni majority country, and also women and LGBT individual. <coughs> he was. 10,000 people killed. He was the tsunami. 126,000 people were killed. Without the tsunami, again, this is a major uh, uh, disaster, global attention. Without the tsunami, there won't be any uh, agreement between Indonesia and the Aceh rebellion. <coughs> Next is Kalimantan. It has one of the largest rainforests in the world. Under Suharto, after 1965, the indigenous Daya community were marginalized. Thus, post Suharto, the Daya tried to revive their identity, their grip on power, making the Muslim Malay feeling threatened because they usually occupy government jobs, civil services. Uh, thus, they began to flex their muscle. Unfortunately, targeting a smaller minority. They target Madurist migrants. Uh, indeed, the root of violence in Kalimantan is the killing of the Chinese, ethnic Chinese, in 1967. Vincent, 1967 was the continuation of 1965. The killing happened not only in Java or Sumatra, like what Joshua Oppenheimer had portrayed in his film, The Act of Killing, but also in Kalimantan. An estimated 3,000 ethnic Chinese were killed, 65,000 displaced from Kalimantan rural areas. Well, these are the killing of the ethnic Maduris total of 6,500. They were almost all beheaded by both Daya militant and Malay militant. Uh, the Maduris are predominantly Muslim group. The Malay is also a predominantly Muslim group. Uh, so these are Muslim killing Muslim, basically. Meanwhile, the Daya are predominantly Christian group. The next island is Sulawesi. We have Ibu Barbara Harvey here in the audience. She wrote a very good book about the Permesta Rebellion in the 1950s, anti-communist rebellion. And with the assistance of the CIA prior to the Jakarta operation of 1965. Uh, this is interesting because in the post Suharto period, this is a Christian minority in a Muslim majority country, while being a minority, Christian minority, they also have Muslim minorities within these Christian minorities. Thing is not that easy, thing is quite complicated, but they managed to avoid big violence taking place in this part of Indonesia. Although, there was a sectarian violence uh, in central Sulawesi, where at least 600 were killed. And this is the area where some Christians were beheaded two weeks ago, last month, in, in, in that part of Sulawesi. Now, this is the most important island, Java Island. <clears throat> uh, the most populated island, 62% of the population with two major ethnic groups, Javanese and Sudanese. Java is 
Indonesia richest area with industries, farmland, rich culture, campuses, media, business group, startup companies. Java is the denominator of Indonesia. Uh, the idea of a secular Indonesian nationalism also nurtured in Java since the 1920s. But the idea to implement the Islamic Sharia also uh, began on Java Island. Uh, it emerged during the independence period and it emerged again after the fall of Suharto. <laughs> At the same time, there are Islamist militants who use bombing, uh, attack, violence to advocate their idea to implement what they claim to be the Islamic Sharia. Uh, one of them, of course, the Bali bombing. Now, 20 years after the fall of Suharto, from Java, we see more and more discriminatory regulations against not only minorities, religious minorities, but also against women. Uh, there are 63 hijab rule uh, for public school and government building all over Indonesia. Anti-LGBT regulation, anti-non-Muslim minorities, anti-non-Sunni minorities, anti-ethnic religious group, or in Bahasa Indonesia we call it aliran kepercayaan. Uh, spiritual movement uh, discrimin being discriminated. The blasphemy law is now being enhanced. It is weaponized to mobilize Muslims, including against then Jakarta governor in 2016-2017. This picture that you are seeing is the biggest protest ever in the history of Indonesia. At least half a million protesters. Uh, using the blasphemy law as a political weapon. Also attack against non-Sunni minorities, uh, Shia, Ahmadiyya, uh, on Sumatra Island alone, there are more than 220 uh, Islamic denomination minorities being discriminated. A church is being closed down. I have difficulties to keep the tally of the churches being closed down over the last uh, 20 years. Some said in the hundreds, some said more than a thousand. Uh, one institute, NGO, here call it at least 2,200. This is one of them. Despite winning the Supreme Court decision that it has to be reopened. But until now, many of these church buildings are still closed. The Molucas Island is another part of Indonesia. Sectarian violence broke up in Ambon, 1999, between Christian and Muslim group killing around 10,000 in five years. And then it spread to North Molucas between the so-called yellow and white militants, loosely organized around the Ternate and Tidore Sultanate. The Sultanate particularly still exists, although geographically, of course, they are in decline. Uh, the violence attracted a jihad militia from Java to send more than 5,000 fighters to the Molucas Island, led by uh, an ally of Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan named Jafar Umar Talib. Uh, he only stopped the militant only after a fatwa from a Yemeni cleric against this jihad operation. Uh, 25,000 were killed in the Molucas Island, sectarian violence. Uh, the police were seen to be sided with the Christian, while the army was seen as siding with the Muslim, roughly. East Timor, Timor-Leste. Uh, violence, referendum in 1999. You might remember that President Ford and State Secretary Henry Kissinger went to Jakarta to meet President Suharto just days before the 1975 invasion of East Timor. 
And of course, the US government uh, did not openly support it, but after it was invaded, the US supported Indonesia until the referendum in 1909. Uh, the last, the easternmost area is Papua. The largest gold mine in the world is in Mount Grasper, ran by Freeport McMoran, a US company. Uh, after the fall of, in 1963, Indonesia invaded West Papua, prompting the US government to push the Netherlands to negotiate. The UN agreed to accept the 1969 ballot involving only 1,026 so-called representatives. No one man, one vote. After the fall of Suharto, uh, this Papua leader, this Edwai, was assassinated by Indonesia's special forces. Uh, and these are the problems in West Papua. Marginalization of indigenous Papuan including radical democratic change that brought dislocation and displacement. Indonesian settlers grew 10% annually. Meanwhile, indigenous Papuan grew only 1.8%. Environmental degradation with mining operation, palm oil plantation. Uh, deforestation there is faster in post Suharto Indonesia. And human rights are repressed for decades. Until now, journalists, foreign journalists are restricted to go to Papua. Uh, the UN monitors, including the UN Human Rights Office in Geneva, despite being invited by President, Indonesian President, uh, still uh, cannot visit the areas. Uh, but Papua, interestingly, resists like rhizome. They are still doing it until now. The underlying issue in Papua is racism against black skin, curly hair, Papua remain. So my point is, uh, again, violence be at violence, impunity be at impunity. Without Indonesia trying to address the mother of all violence, the 1965 and all other violence, of course, uh, this country will still be overwhelmed by human rights violation discrimination, racism, uh, and the rise of sectarianism that sooner or later will be a problem for the world, not only for minorities living in Indonesia. Thank you. Um, Mr. Harsono, I just thank you so much for the work you're doing. I mean, it's, I said at the beginning, I, I have really, I've been intellectually, emotionally, politically moved these past weeks, um, kind of following your articles and your um, public, uh, uh, with the, the work that you're doing, you know, which has obviously influenced, you know, a younger generation like Vincent Bevins and um, now I, I kind of late in my career is totally influencing me. I mean, I, I was thinking earlier today, I don't consider myself a um, insular, you know, I'm not a US historian focused on a certain region in a certain decade. I do many countries across 500 years, but the work you're doing and the work Mr. Bevins is doing has, has really, you know, challenged me in sort of insular ways. I don't think I've been thinking globally enough and the Latin American Asian connection. I mean, I thought much about sort of the Japanese in Brazil, but I mean, the, the work you're doing is is so important. And I, I thank you, especially, I mean, the work you've been doing in West Papua is, is super impressive and um, really awe-inspiring. So Again, I, I feel honored and humbled to be here with you, and I appreciate you both being here. Um, I'm not going to actually. I've got a, a you know many pages of questions that I might pose <laughs> um, that I would like to, but I'm just going to turn to the chat because we have a bunch of great questions here, um, and uh, kind of let you um, chat with some Montanans or other um, 
uh, Western folks in the Western US or elsewhere. Um, I don't know, uh, Vincent uh, or Andreas, if you had a chance to read any of these and if there's any you want to answer in particular, just jump in. Otherwise, I'm just gonna sort of start at the beginning. Um, and Steve Levine asks, is the United States primarily responsible or rather just complicit with and an accessory to the massacres that were perpetrated by local local right-wing elites in the countries you focus on. So I'll just open it up to either of you that want to jump in. Thanks, Andres. Well, I want to hear from Andres on this one too, but I would say that in the case of Indonesia in 1965, the vast majority of what happened was driven by local actors. The, the vast majority of the violence was carried out by, I mean, all the violence was carried out by local actors. Local conflicts were the vast majority of what was at stake. But I think it still might be possible to, to call the United States primarily responsible for the mass murder. And 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 I think don't think there's really a, a contradiction there. I think that often um, the, the widest, uh, in the widest sense, geopolitical space-time, sort of world, histor world historical space-time and, and the knowledge of what the consequences will be for action X and action, and action Y um, can often shape local um, decision-making without the United States having to do a lot. And in the case of Indonesia 65, the United States did not do a lot. We still don't know who actually came up with the idea of carrying out this mass murder at this time in this way. Um, but again, I don't really try to rewrite this history um, uh, and I want to refer to John Russo, who was asked recently, you know, give a one sentence summary as to why the mass murder happened. And he said, to show the United States that they were worthy of aid and that they should be able to consolidate the Suharto dictatorship. So whether or not the United States planned this, I don't think they probably did, maybe they did. Uh, uh, they, they were certainly enthusiastic to some extent, uh, who knows if they would have preferred something else to happen, but if it was the case that the Indonesian military believed that the most powerful country on earth wanted them to do it, and then they started doing it, asked, hey, are you liking that we're doing this? And then the United States government says, yes, we do. I think it still might be possible to call them primarily responsible, even though there was only a few in Americans in Indonesia. But Andreas, what do you think? Who, who is primarily responsible for the mass violence in 1965? Uh, wow, well, I guess those that have to be held responsible the most is the Indonesian army. The Indonesian army, because with the support of the backing of the U.S. government, also with the uh, with the help of some Muslim organizations, including the Nadatul Ulama the Netatu Ulama already did their own internal investigation regarding the violence that their members had committed in 1965, 66, 67. But also uh, a disproportionately bigger role was played by the Catholics in Indonesia. Uh, the Catholics play a role in building alliances, especially in inciting hate, I guess, against the communists. There are already some research written about the role of the Catholics, then led by a Dutch Indonesian priest named Pater Pick. Uh, Pater Pick, he, he was involved in, in those anti-communist violence. So the Indonesian army, some Muslim organization, and the Catholics. Um, yeah, if I could just jump in, and I, I wanted to go all to the questions in the chat, but I'm so fascinated by this because uh, in Vincent's book, you know, a lot comes out about popular education, Paulo Freire is there uh, in spades. And I was wondering about that, about the 
a multi-religious nature of Indonesian society in 65, 66 versus the rise of liberation theology in Brazil really strongly, you know, in the late 50s and 60s. So that's so interesting, Andreas, that you talk about this very right, you know, counter-revolutionary movement of the Catholic Church in Indonesia. Is that like a significant point of comparison, religious, uh, the, the, the power of different sort of religious political trends? So, sorry, sorry, uh, would you please repeat it again? I'm just curious about the very conservative role of the Catholics you're describing in Indonesia versus the rise of liberation theology and the sort of powerful role yeah. of liberation theology and Paulo Freire in Brazil yeah. in the same period. Mm -hmm. Well, there is no recognition on part of the Catholics in Indonesia to be compared with the, the soul searching within the Catholics in Latin America. We have the Paulo Freire, and we have, of course, uh, Pope Francis now, a uh, product of those era. Here in Indonesia, they remain very conservative. Uh, in fact, just last week, the Catholic uh, priests and, and, and bishop in Papua, in Eastern Indonesia, they issue a joint statement from several dioceses in Papua, all of the dioceses in Papua, protesting the silence of the Catholic Church Indonesia in Jakarta. They felt that the Indonesian Catholic bishop did not support any human rights investigation or protest against any impunity uh, among Christian, Papua is a predominantly Christian area in Indonesia, among Papuans. So it showed that they remain uh, conservative despite uh, progresses that made in many other parts of the world among Catholic organization, not only in Latin America, but also in terms of sexual violence against minors in the US, uh, within the Catholic churches in the US, Australia, or Europe. Here, the Catholic church remain uh, protective, uh, uh, protecting the sexual predators within the Catholic church. Thank you so much. Uh, Vincent, do you want to add? Yeah, I actually want to ask, on, yeah, if I could ask Andres a little more about that, because um, one thing I never asked him in person or, or uh, I didn't get a sense from the book, but I think it's really interesting based on what he said earlier, is I want to ask Andres two things about the relationship between the violence that we see in the post Suharto era and the early years of Indonesia. I'm curious, like, in the stupidest way ever, I want to ask, when did ethnic violence in Indonesia really start? Was it, was, it, was it as bad in the first half of the 20th century as it was in the second? And I also wanna ask if you, how much you sort of believe that Sukarno really was offering a, a version of Indonesian identity, which was much more inclusive and pluralistic than the one that came after him. I mean, there's some people that say that, oh, if, if, if that, you know, that kind of, uh, that view of Indonesianists had been able to carry on, there'd be a lot less, uh, inter-ethnic uh, and inter-religious strife. And other people say, ah, he's kind of a Javanese imperialist. Uh, you, if you look at the, the way he acted um, in Southeast Asia or towards Papua, uh, you know, he, he himself was a sort of Javanese chauvinist. Um, how can we compare the, you know, 1900 to 1965 to the period after Sukarno? How much did things change with the end of the Sukarno era? Uh, regarding this ethnicity, after, independence, after independence, the Sukarno regime and also the Suharto regime kept, to some extent, kept the anti-Chinese discrimination uh, first imposed by the Dutch uh, during the colonial time. So here they created a term 
call uh, pribumi or the sons of the land vis-a-vis uh, -vis non pribumi uh, you know non pribumi means they are not sons of of the land the native but pribumi comprise hundreds of ethnicities the japanese the sundanese the malay the maduris the bata whatever there are hundreds of them meanwhile non pribumi was especially used against ethnic chinese basically what the government was trying to do is they are different thus it is justified to discriminate ethnic chinese that term is dangerous because once you introduce racism it might be used to discriminate multiple ethnic groups indonesia being a modern country of course people move from one area to the other in sumatra for instance ethnic japanese is now being discriminated they are seen as the new colonial master in kalimantan there are tension between multiple ethnic groups the maduris the japanese the bugis the daya and in kalimantan they introduce a new term it is called pendatang pendatang means newcomers they also introduce a new term uh, penduduk asli uh, native son this is to discriminate fellow pribumi that move from java to kalimantan and also in the molokas island there is a term called bbm or bugis buton bugis buton makassar these are the ethnic group mostly muslim that are being seen as as aggressive as as opportunistic in the molokas island so once you introduce racism in your term in your government in your regulation it will snowball and it is becoming bigger and bigger uh, it had never happened before that uh, you know the murderers being murdered like that in kalimantan or in indonesia per se if it is not being undone if it is not being investigated that if indonesia do not learn the truth about those mass murders just like what happened in 1965 i'm afraid we are going to see another crisis in the future in a bigger scale very very probably uh Vincent, what is the second question oh i i um the question is whether or not the sukarno era was i mean you you alluded to the fact that there was anti chinese racism legally implemented even under sukarno uh, i just was asking how much you believed that the uh, the sort of that ethnic and religious tensions were less problematic on, in the Sukarno era and how much they got worse as a result of Suharto or if you think um, that transition from Sukarno to Suharto was not so important in generating the the type of violence you look at the 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 the, the sectarianism the discrimination in Indonesia was started by Sukarno not right. by Suharto it was sukarno during the sukarno era in 1952 when the government started to differentiate between what they claim to be a religion and what they call kepercayaan or belief uh, kepercayaan means ethnic religion indonesia again has more than 400 ethnic religious group kejawen among the japanese is being the biggest one they have their own sacred place. In 1952, the Sukarno, the Sukarno government introduced the definition of a religion. A religion should have a god, a god, monotheistic god, and then some prophets, a holy book, and a global network. <coughs> of course, many of these smaller religions, they have you know they worship ancestors or they have multiple gods hinduism has hundreds of gods if not thousands confucianism is different buddhism is different but that was the beginning of indonesia making a monotheistic religion a 
Christianity and Islam to be the first among hundreds of religions in Indonesia. In 1965, uh, January, President Sukarno introduced the toxic blasphemy law, maximum five years, in which he said that anyone who commits blasphemy to defame a religion, uh, uh, he or she might be sent to prison. And in that blasphemy law, Sukarno introduced only six religions in Indonesia. Islam, Protestantism, Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism. Meaning that he immediately discriminate local believers, uh, the ethnic religious group. Until today, they still cannot have their faith, their belief on Indonesian ID card. If they want to have uh, ID card or marriage certificate or birth certificate, they have to quote unquote convert uh, or in the official language to align their faith with one of the six uh, recognized religion. And of course now, 50 years after the blasphemy law, Indonesia is falling into a bottomless well. If Indonesia does not want to revoke the blasphemy law, uh, some writers use the word the Pakistanization of Indonesia. This is going to be like Pakistan. And once, uh, once it is becoming like Pakistan, very difficult to control. Um, if I may jump in here, we do have um, someone on the Zoom tonight that Andreas is personally familiar with and both um, Andreas and Vincent are familiar with. Dr. Barbara Harvey is with us. Uh, she was the Deputy Chief of Mission in Jakarta when I served there in the 90s. Um, and she's a distinguished scholar in the group in the field. Uh, I think she'd like to address some of the questions on US government involvement. If Barbara, you'd like to unmute and share your vid video. As, as soon as I can unmute. Uh, yeah, just a couple of comments. And in fact, Vincent sort of mentioned something. Uh, certainly the US was directly involved in the regional rebellions in 58, uh, giving support through the CIA to the dissident colonels, both in Sumatra and in North Sulawesi. But in the 65 events, I have not seen evidence that convinced me that the United States was involved in any planning. I think as in the Cold War context, they did welcome the destruction of the PKI, the Communist Party, though I'm not sure they thought in terms of the destruction of the party as being the killing of hundreds and thousands of people. I mean, I, thought, I wasn't in Jakarta or Indonesia at that time, though I had been earlier. But in talking to people who were there then, I get a sense that the killings were not, in fact, welcome. Uh, the antagonism between the Indonesian army and the Communist Party certainly goes back at least to 1948, the Madiun Rebellion during the revolution, which in the army talked of as a stab in the back because while they were fighting the Dutch, a uh, leftist group attacked the Indonesian army. And the antagonism was very clear during the time I was first in Indonesia in 1960 to 64. Also the antagonism between the communists and the Islamic groups uh, partly dates to that, but also to the efforts of the Communist Party to implement land reform in the uh, 64 period, 63, 64. There are very few large landowners in Java. Most of the large parcels of, parcels of land are associated with Islamic boarding schools. And so the attempt by the Communist Party to implement land reform was seen by many Muslim leaders, particularly the Nadatul Ulama, as an attack on them. Uh, one other point I'd like to make about the Suharto era, and Andreas, you may be too young to have lived through this, but Indonesia was extremely poor in 1960 to 64. Uh, one, one story I might tell 
in one of his speeches, Suharto had said, or Sukarno had said, my people would eat stones if they asked them to. And in Surabaya, my friends were saying, but boom, stones are so expensive these days. So I think there was a lot of uh, feeling that Sukarno had lost his way as a leader. Uh, the ethnic antagonism certainly has been more uh, in recent years. And there's much to criticize about the whole Suharto era. But those are the points that I would like to make. And I'd just like to say hi to Andreas before I shut up. Uh, thank you so much, Barbara, Vincent, or Andreas, if you guys want to jump in. We're, we're over time, but anybody that wants to stay, please stay, and we'll stay as long as our um, as, uh, Vincent and Andreas will or people. Yeah, sure. Vincent, there are there are many questions for you about. Yeah. Uh, so let, let, for you, from yeah, Stephen so, Levine. So yeah, briefly. Primarily responsible, or rather just complicit with an, an accessory to the massacres. Yeah, so let me respond directly to what she said. Um, it's absolutely right that there is not evidence of the United States being involved in the planning of the mass murder. There's no evidence of anybody doing any planning at all. We don't know who planned it, when or why on the Indonesian or the US side. I don't know if the US, the US was involved in planning it. I would not be surprised to find that they were not at all, that they simply reacted to the unfolding of events that, um, that began in early October 1965. Um, if we want to find that out, the government that, um, uh, uh, that uh, some of the people on the call have worked for could declassify their files um, in, uh, re regarding CIA activities in the 1960s. But what we do know, as soon as the killing started, the estate, the embassy in Jakarta got detailed uh, repeated updates on what was being done. The United States uh, 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 did not uh, tell uh, in any way indicate that they wanted the killing to stop. Uh, on the contrary, they made it very clear that the resumption of foreign aid to the nascent Suharto regime would be dependent on the destruction um, of the Sukarno regime, knowing very well that the way that they were currently carrying out that destruction was by killing hundreds of thousands of people. One uh, uh, employee of the embassy at the time later admitted to giving lists of people that should be killed. Um, we have another cable that indicates the Indonesian military asks the State Department um, exactly how much are these dead bodies worth to you? These people were killing, how much are we going to get from that? Um, so it is absolutely true that there is no evidence that the US was planning this in the first months of 1965, but it's quite clear that it was, it was complicit at the very least. And um, yeah, of course, there was poverty, there was ethnic conflicts, there was um, violence already erupting over land reform. All of those things were necessary for creating the kind of horrible tragedy we saw unfold. But there was a lot of poverty around the world at the time. There was a lot of ethnic conflicts, there was a lot of land reform. Um, to ex fully explain the 1965 violence, I think we have to understand that the, the way the Indonesian military understood what they believed the US wanted them to do. That's all. <laughs> Andreas, are you gonna do you want to respond? Talk to that. Uh, well, again, I believe that those that are directly responsible should be the Indonesian Army and some Muslim organization and the Catholic Church. But whoever being held responsible, there should be uh, two investigation first. Uh, Indonesia should stop uh, the propaganda against the communists until now. In Indonesia, communism, Marxism, and Leninism are still banned. Uh, theoretically, if you are found to quote unquote propagate communism in Indonesia, uh, you will go to prison and it is a long prison term. In 2015, the Indonesian government organized the first ever uh, conference 
symposium on the Maseka, 1965, uh, in which people talk about uh, not only atrocities, extrajudicial killings, political prisoners, sexual violence after sexual violence after sexual violence. But then there are protests from retired military officers, from Muslim organizations saying that this current government is trying to revive communism and it stopped. Now it is now continuing again. So these are the things that, that Indonesia need to do. It will be incredible if the US government can, can support this kind of initiative. But then again, at the time, the Obama administration did not, did not help. Uh, I hope the Biden ad administration will help in pursuing past human rights abuses in Indonesia. Thank you, Johnny. Um, thanks. So, you know, we are like nearing 830. We're well over the time that we had scheduled for this. But um, as I had uh, commented to Dina a while ago, you know, we could spend hours talking to Vincent Bevins. Um, we could spend hours talking to Andreas Harsono. And I, you know, I've been looking through these uh, questions. There's so many people who are here with us tonight who have been in Latin America and Indonesia, have, you know, various angles on, on the story, on this conversation. Um, you know, I wish we could go all night. I think we're going to have to let our guests go. Um, they're both engaged in such really important work. And again, I mean, we, we so much appreciate uh, you, Vincent. Your, your book is just, it's stunningly written. You know, I know um, you strove to bridge, you know, academic rigor and commitment to your interview subjects and also make it accessible to a broad audience. And I, I just think on all of those fronts, you succeeded spectacularly and you've opened up a, a conversation for us. Uh, you know, and I, I've listened to you, I said, you know, in many podcasts individually, but I was so excited to hear you, um, you know, with your sort of mentor, you know, somebody who I know helped you out a lot when you got to Indonesia, Andreas Harsono, who is, you know, a, an icon for the fight for the free press and for, you know, making these stories from the third world known. So it's been an immense privilege really to, to read your work and to have you and um, Mr. Harsono together with us in Montana, in Western Montana. Just, you know, really super thank you very much. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Dina to close out our Mansfield session. Thank you all for staying with us a little bit longer than we had intended. And especially, you know, just a huge thank you, Vincent Bevins, uh, the Jakarta Method and, uh, you know, Mr. Andreas Harsono has done so much for the free press and human rights in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. We really thank you for joining us. Tina. And I'll just add my thanks, Jody, to you for being a wonderful moderator. Um, Vincent and Andreas, thank you so much for sharing your expertise with the people of Montana and others. Barbara Harvey, who has long been a mentor to me and a role model for really diving deep and learning more and having a great passion for the people of Indonesia. And thanks to our audience. This wraps up our fall 2020 dialogue series. We've had thousands of people joining us for eight sessions, and we hope that you'll join us uh, this spring. Uh, promises to be another wonderful series of talks. We have a 
Uh, Trump administration official expected to speak on China policy. We will have congressional leaders um, in the Problem Solvers Caucus. And of course, we'll have Dr. Anthony Fauci joining us in our Mansfield lecture on February 17th. So I'd also like to particularly thank the Mansfield Center team who have done a tremendous job um, in transferring our usual in-person dialogues to Zoom dialogues. We've all learned a lot, uh, but we have been able to stay vibrant thanks to Randy Edwards, uh, Betta Leon Del Sordo, um, Mariah Thomas, Mackie Haller, Heidi Blair. So really grateful to my colleagues and all of you. So thanks again and good night.